Welcome to episode 206 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. In today's episode, I'm so excited to introduce you to Sarah Wilson, Director of Human Experience Research at Walmart. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to Sarah Wilson, Director of Human Experience Research at Walmart. This is a fun episode because we are sharing a live podcast that was recorded while I was a speaker on the live podcast stage at Green Books IIEX North America Conference in Austin a couple of weeks ago. If you remember, I went and then visited the Human Behavior Lab at Texas A&M and have shared two interviews from that experience that are available in the show notes for you to go check out. The reason that I was in Texas was for this conference. In case you aren't familiar with IIEX, it stands for Insight Innovation Exchange, and it was a fantastic event. Also, if you remember a couple weeks ago in episode 196, when Priscilla McKinney of Little Bird Marketing was on the show, we talked about how we would both be presenting there as well as at IIEX Europe, which is taking place in Amsterdam this June 2022. And again, I'm so excited to be attending and speaking at that conference as well. For all my European friends and listeners, if you want to come to that conference in Amsterdam or say hi while I'm there, let me know. Anyway, at IIEX North America, I had the honor of interviewing Sarah Wilson from Walmart about some of the work they're doing in behavioral science, including a project we've been working on together around sustainability, as Walmart has some pretty fantastic goals they're working toward in these coming years. I won't keep on talking about it now as you're going to hear all about it in our session, which was called Nudging for Good at Walmart. Now, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. There are lots of important links, including to past episodes like those I've already mentioned and others, as well as related books, ways to learn more about Green Book and IIEX, and so much more within the show notes for the episode, which are waiting for you within the app you're listening to or at thebrainybusiness.com slash 206. Those already on the Brainy Business list got a direct link from me in the email you receive every Friday. Not on the list yet? Simply sign up for any freebie at thebrainybusiness.com and you'll be automatically added. The freebie for this episode is the first chapter of my award-winning book, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You. And if you already have the book, in which case, thank you, you'll also be automatically added to the list when you get your copy of the free PDF companion workbook. Both are housed in our free behavioral economics community called the Be Thoughtful Revolution. There's a link to join that global community in those show notes as well. Now let's jump right into that live interview. Nope. Yeah. Oh, Oh. huzzah. All right. It's the word of the day. I know. (laughs) I had, I had someone ask me if I used to work at Disneyland recently because I said huzzah. Or in medieval times. Oh, is that a, well, I guess it it fits, right? So (laughs) this is a fun way to start. Welcome everybody. (laughs) I'm Melina Palmer, uh, host of the Brainy Business Podcast. I'm so excited to be here uh, with Sarah Wilson from Walmart today. And we're going to be talking about nudging for good at Walmart. I am an applied behavioral economist. And so talking about uh, the psychology of why people buy, why they do the things they do, and how that ties in with all sorts of brand experiences. And just really excited uh, to be able to help share some of that with you today and a really cool project uh, that's been going on at Walmart, uh, one that we've been working on and being able to share just the greater experience there. So uh, I feel like it's always best to let the guest introduce themselves. So Sarah, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and the work that you do at Walmart? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Melina. So I am at Walmart. Like you said, I've been here for the last 15 years. And I lead the human experience research team, which is a part of our customer insights organization. 
And my team works to bring forward insights that customers can't necessarily voice themselves. So it's um, the idea of what they're feeling, thinking that they can't tell us through quant and qual research. So a lot of overlap in what you do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so before we get into the discussion of you know some of the really specific initiatives that you are working on, uh, can you talk a little bit about sustainability and the initiatives, uh, or I guess the uh, plans that Walmart's taking on, those big things that you've said that you're going to be doing? What's Walmart really focusing on in the sustainability space? Yeah, so Walmart has made a commitment to becoming a regenerative company, which um, we're believing in making a healthy planet that has prosperity for everyone. And we've made a lot of really big commitments. And some of those things are like zero emissions in our supply chain, zero waste in our operations, using less plastic and reducing our plastic uh, virgin material by 15%. So a lot of big lofty goals. And I urge anyone who's not familiar with all of the work Walmart's doing to go check it out. Yeah. And I mean, with that, it's even small changes can make a really big difference when you have such a large footprint like Walmart does. And, you know, we hear about, of course, global warming and people are talking about sustainability and uh, making good choices and things like that. And there are, uh, you know, multiple sides to this, but I think that you just don't talk enough or we don't hear enough about the impacts in a way that resonates with people, which is a big reason why you end up having a problem of people not taking an action, but uh, specifically about plastic usage, because we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, what are some of those big stats that you're able to share that matter, you know, from Walmart's perspective? Yeah. So research on um, plastic. So we're talking specifically about plastic shopping bags that you use to take your groceries home in. It takes a thousand years for a plastic bag to degrade, which is um, kind of impressive. Uh, (laughs) I don't think anything else is that long. Um, The other thing that I found fascinating was 14 plastic shopping bags is the equivalent of driving a mile or um, a gallon of gas, sorry, a gallon of gas, 14 shopping bags. So just the impact of that. And you think about your, your typical trip and how many bags you use, right? How many gallons of gas are you using? Right. And that's, I mean, like you said, thinking about it in this slightly reframed way in the behavioral sciences, we talk about how the way you say something, how you say it matters much more than what it is that you are saying. And so just to say, oh yeah, we should reduce plastic bag usage because plastic's a problem. But we think about carbon footprint and you don't necessarily think about, you know, you're going to reduce gas usage, but not thinking about 14 bags. I mean, who doesn't have 14 bags hanging out at home or just an extra one here or there that you're going to grab? And those little things can really make uh, a difference for sure. So when we are going to be talking about some of the behavioral science, we said the session itself is talking about nudging for good at Walmart. And so just to give a little bit of a background for anyone that's not as familiar with behavioral science, essentially science has shown that 95% of the decisions that people make are done on a subconscious level. And that includes buying decisions and the actions and the things that we're doing at any given time at any day. So we have our subconscious brain really running constantly. I like to think about it and talk about it like a gatekeeper or a receptionist when you're trying to get a meeting with a busy executive, that brain subconscious filter is saying, this is normal. I have a rule for this. I know how to do that. Normal, normal, normal. There's a plan. I know how to do it. And then every so often we'll flag the conscious brain to say, hmm, that's a little bit out of the norm. Not really sure what I'm supposed to do with this. Uh, so go ahead, conscious, it's your turn to go and do something now. So when we talk about habitual buying, it's not just the stuff that you get, you know, the same type of chips or the coffee that you drink every single week or whatever that is when you're going on the shopping trips, but even the action of putting those items in the cart, how you're going to be bagging items, where you're looking in the store, what you're looking for, that entire experience. And we've all had that issue where you forgot your bag in the car. Maybe you wanted to be 
sustainable. You bought the reusable bag and you left it at home. You left it in the back of the car. And then you thought, Ugh, you know, next time, next time I'm going to do better. Uh, but it's because of that habitual buying process that it is a problem. And so being able to send the right message at the right time to get someone to change their behavior can actually be a really difficult thing to if you're working on the wrong problem, which I know is something that we had talked about uh, quite a bit here. So can you talk a little about some of those uh, kind of problems with plastic and how you came into uh, bringing in behavioral sciences within your greater teams at Walmart and the projects and things around this plastic bag usage problem? Yeah. So there were kind of three things that happened before we worked on our project together. And the first was that um, when sometimes when, as a company, we have the right intentions, but it in, creates a negative result. So a few years ago, we thought, okay, we want to use less plastic. How can we use less plastic? All right, if we decrease um, the amount of plastic in a bag by like 0.04, right, like teensy tiny bit, then we can have a big impact overall. And, and it, it, we did all this testing, and then in the lab, it performed great. Um, and so we said, wow, what a great way for us to help reduce plastic. But if you can kind of imagine being that shopper, and um, there, over time, that didn't happen overnight, but over time, maybe you've had an experience where you've got a shopping bag and you've got it full of glass jars, right? I'm going to just go to the extreme here. A bunch of uh, pasta sauce all crammed yeah. into one bag there. Yeah, and it breaks. And the pasta sauce falls out and it like spills all over the floor. And that like traumatic experience of like having to clean it up and like, hey, that was dinner. Now, now we got to make a different plan, right? Like, so these experiences over time where a bag had a failure, then what was happening is customers were compensating for that. So it wasn't that it happened all the time. And it, it definitely um, was not, like I said, immediate. But then we saw like this shift in behavior of more used bags. So we thought, you know, doing this great thing, reducing plastic, but then it like, we did not reduce the bag by 50% to make up for double bagging or other things, right? So it, it shifted behavior. And so again, that like right intention created a negative result. So, so maybe not addressing the right problem in that sense. And then the second was that as a large corporation, we move with speed. We are fast. And um, sometimes... The easy answer is not always the right answer, like you said, right? So how are we? How do we know we're addressing the right problem? So the thought was, okay, we know these bags can hold about twice as much as what people are putting in it. Um, we should just tell people, like we should just tell them, like put one more item in the bag, and and like people will do it. Right. Logically, that makes sense. Right. right? Like yeah. we can fit more. Um, so. We, we thought that that would help and realized um, in doing some testing um, that people didn't see the sign. So it's that last piece that you were talking about, right? The habitual nature. When people are checking out, they are busy. They are working. Um, they're not really thinking about the bag. The bag is not something that a lot of people pay attention to other than maybe like where are my eggs going and are my bananas being smushed or my bread? But they're not really paying attention to the bag itself. And so what we saw through eye tracking was that the signs that we had put up weren't being seen basically at all. It was like 13% of the time people glanced at it. So um, it's that habits element of shopping and that at that moment in the store, it's really hard to get people's attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and that's like you said, so when you think about jobs to be done, I'm here, I'm having to bag the thing, I'm thinking about where, spending more time fiddling around to try and find the barcode on the thing so I can scan the next one and kids are running around or whatever, you're trying to be paying attention. And the signage, which as far as anybody who, coming from the logical side of the brand, you'd say, it's right there. It's right where they're putting the bag. How could you miss it? They couldn't possibly miss it. And they did. Everyone. <laughs> Nobody paid attention to it, and it didn't change the behavior. And even if it hadn't been made worse by the double bagging issue, uh, you still aren't having that reduction in bag usage. And like you said, the bags, I think, could handle 
on average seven items and people are putting like four in the bag. Exactly. But that's a complex thing to say, by the way, did you know that you can actually put seven items in your bag? Like what a weird <laughs> thing to say to somebody. And so it just doesn't end up having any sort of impact and having someone kind of over your shoulder saying, oh, tap, 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 excuse me, you should put more items in that bag is weird too, yeah. because people don't want to be told how to bag an item necessarily. So we have the problem that started with, so it's reducing plastic being an issue. We're needing to change some of those habits. We can't just tell them that they can fit more items in there or to use less bags. And so what do you do without having an impact on customer experience? You could just remove all of the bags you could make it uh, so they can't get them or they have to ask questions. But uh, so looking at that problem, what's the next step kind of in solutions of looking to, to fix that? Yeah. So we had um, on, on different projects, we had run some workshops where we were trying to bring in the idea of behavioral sciences. So we knew with this project that we needed to go beyond the obvious answer. We needed to explain kind of the difference between system one, system two, and also knew that we needed to do it in a different way than we had in the past because we had run a few workshops where we um, tried to do like a cram session where it was like behavioral sciences and like 60 minutes and now you're the expert and go create some nudges and that just completely bombed. Um, so we knew that um, it's, while we're super excited about behavioral sciences, right, and we want other people to be just as excited about it, it's, it's, it's a hard um, t thing to force people into in a short period of time. It's not something that people can quickly grasp, especially in 60 minutes. Like, just it's it's a little bit more complex than that <laughs> a lot more complex yeah. than it's that just... as far as you know getting degrees in that and everything um i want to take just a quick moment for everyone that's not familiar with nudging so if you're newer to behavioral sciences and hopefully having this moment of oh my gosh this is so awesome i can't wait to learn more about it there is a great book that's called nudge by richard thaler and Cass sunstein that talks about these little shifts in behavior i talk about looking for micro moments where there's a little something going on. You can do just a little bit to nudge someone to do what you know that they should do. So we all are like to think that we're logical, rational people making logical choices in everything that we do, right? Well, <laughs> we know humans aren't really that way. And so what we end up having from traditional economics is that it doesn't accurately predict behavior. It's looking at what people should do and not what they actually do. If we tell people to you put more items in the bag, they should just do it, right? It should just work that way. Uh, but it doesn't always. Like we all know that we want to uh, eat right and exercise, that we should be healthier. And then maybe we find ourselves uh, binge watching Netflix and eating a bag of Cheetos. That's like my go-to reference. I feel like I use all the time, right? But so you know that you should but you don't necessarily change the habit. And what's really amazing and one of my favorite things about the behavioral sciences is what you think should work on the surface often doesn't. But if you take a step back, you think about the problem in a different way, you look from a different perspective and start to ask, you know, well, why is it that way? And knowing that in behavioral science, we understand these rules of the brain that can help better predict what people will do. So one of my favorite examples is one of taking the stairs instead of the elevator. And we would all say, hey, you could be healthier. You probably had an initiative like this at some point at your work where you, some companies I know give out pedometers for a month for everybody to walk more. Or they say you should take the stairs an extra time or whatever it is. And you always have those moments where you say, well, I'm running really late for this meeting right now, but you know, tomorrow I'm going to take the stairs or on the way back. But then, you know, you only have a few more minutes again. It can be difficult. And so telling people, even with signage, doesn't necessarily change the problem or explaining why it's going to make a difference. In this case, this particular study slowed down the elevator doors. So it took an extra, I believe, 26 seconds for the doors to open or close. 
which is an eon of time when you're waiting for an elevator and all of a sudden you just go, ugh, I'm just going to go take the stairs, right? And you just pop over. And they had that going. They didn't have to tell anybody, but naturally everyone starts taking the stairs. And even when they set those back to normal, it people didn't change their behavior because they had formed a new habit. They got used to taking the stairs. It's now the status quo, easy to do. So with bag usage, we have to find the moments that you can be finding those little nudgeable spots to help shift behavior. And we have two really great spots here because there's the customer side, of course, but you also have this amazing wealth of potential bag reduction in the associate space because you have so many team members and things at Walmart. So let's talk a little bit about that, you know, thinking through uh, the project and kind of how to look at this from a different angle. And actually, I want you to talk about understanding the problem. So from the team perspective, which is some of what you were just talking about, for your teams internally, like you said, your team is all about behavioral science and how amazing it is and how it can be helpful within all of Walmart. But the rest of Walmart isn't necessarily doing anything in that space yet. So how did you go about, like you said, in that first workshop, you were looking for, oh my gosh, we want everyone to be as excited as we are. But that's not necessarily the thing that you need in that moment. You just need them to be interested enough to want to be part of the project, right? Right. Yeah, we started with just making sure everybody was on the same page with the problem. Like you're saying, problem to solve, right? We knew that we wanted to use less plastic. We knew that we couldn't sign it, that that wasn't going to work. Um, and so we leveraged kind of two different tools, I'll say. Um, one being the kind of idea of question storming. And so us um, prompting the questions and, and helping people to bring forward the knowledge, the working experience and knowledge that they have inside of the company, right? And the um, nuances that we don't have as experts. So just being allowing them to help answer some of our curiosities of like, well, what if it was like this? Or how would you address it like that? And um, so they didn't have to understand nudges, but they were participating in this kind of opening their mindsets and thinking about it in a different way. And then the second was like having an expert. So having you come in and help to speak to behavioral sciences. And so there was this social proof, right? This understanding of we don't have to, to worry about all of all of that stuff. We're just answering a bunch of questions and question storming and um, getting to explore it in a different way. Right. And I love this, too, because it helps with uh, something, if, any, if the audience isn't familiar with the IKEA effect, it is a, a real thing in that we like things that we create more than things that other people create. So where if you've heard, you know, often, you know, talking about various projects and, you know, let them be a part of the conversation, truly people like things that they built or had even just a tiny bit of being able to help build than things that they didn't. And sometimes that's the idea. And one of my favorite things about question storming, which is one of my favorite things to do with, uh, with companies and with students and everything, is to go through and know that asking questions, you're not tied to the answer. And it's really easy to find the right answer to the wrong question. Like you were talking about in the, how do we reduce plastic usage? how do we use less plastic? The obvious answer is have less plastic in the bags. Ta-da, we did it, right? But that caused a whole new problem because it wasn't the real root problem, which, you know, obviously still working on finding some of those root pieces to be working on. But when you ask, if you ask a question, how do we use less plastic? People are coming up with answers, like in a traditional brainstorming session, you end up with a lot of... Um, people that don't want to throw something out because you might look stupid or you might get saddled with a project that you don't have time for. And when you're having to come up with a solution, it can be very difficult to get that out of your brain. But coming up with the question to say, well, what if this or how might we that uh, can get into a very interesting space and having the right people in the room means we're able to have people asking a diverse set of questions that help 
uncover a little bit more what the true problem might be. So leading up to this workshop that we did, you and I had a lot of conversations in talking about what the problem might be and, of course, shaping the experience. Uh, What do you want to share about what that experience was like in looking at thinking about the problem in a different way? Yeah. Um, So I wanted to think about the workshop almost like a design sprint for behavioral sciences. And to your point, we did a not exactly crazy eight exercise where you, you do eight things really quick or as many as you can do, but allowed people to get those ideas out, those easy ideas, right? The, the like, okay, so we'll take a little bit of plastic out or the extreme of like, okay, there'll be zero bags and it'll all be reusable or right, like all the, the, the easy ideas. So then we could get to kind of the richness and um, prompt with the questions. But um, started out with this idea of, of just allowing people to explore. And um, the, there's kind of a nuance. One of the things that we talked a lot about was like, okay, where are the interactions with the bags? So we created a, a behavior map and each of those interactions, all the insights that we had, put it down on a map. And there's kind of, it splits into two pathways. You've got a customer and you've got an associate. And so there's two, two tools, right, on... on um, how to reduce or, or how to think about it, right? And um, that was kind of one of the first things that we did was kind of consider those as options and, and specifically broke, broke out and focused on each of them separately. So there was an overlap in any confusion. Right. And that the experience journeys they have with the bags are very different. And so, you know, for the customer, like I was talking about, what we have, you know, there's the option of when you're planning for the shopping trip, what app are they using or where are they handwriting, what they're going to be putting down of what they need when they go to the store, where might they be keeping stuff? Do you need anything in the parking lot that has signage before they're getting overwhelmed at the checkout line? Is there something to be priming that experience where they're thinking more about, uh, what's to come. I, uh, I remember, so I had made the suggestion and we were using the language, a lot of the sad turtle, right? So when you talk about, uh, there's a great, uh, company called the Littery, uh, that they have taken and moved it. So getting people to throw away their garbage the right time, properly sort it every single time is another very difficult problem and very much tied in with this plastic, uh, usage issue. But when you think about telling people not to litter, what do we look to do? We look to use logic. We think we need one more, you know, photo of a turtle with a straw on its nose or talking about garbage island or whatever this is. So we were talking about, you know, remember the turtles or something that we were going to have around to help just frame in a different way what the problem was and trigger in with some emotion, like something like that could be interesting or all these various points where you might be looking for those little nudgeable moments that can slightly adjust behavior. And so... Again, though, with the associates, you have back of house, uh, you have email interactions, you have all these points where they're interacting with bags, even if they're not necessarily thinking about it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, I know I have a favorite uh, (laughs) intervention suggestion that came up from that workshop. Uh, Do you want to talk about some of your favorite insights that came up and just uh, maybe some of that like feedback from the process or anything? Yeah. So... Um, I think I know your favorite. Um, the, I was in store research, um, maybe a month ago and doing observations, um, just checking, you know, front end stuff. And there was an experience where a customer had purchased a single item and the associate had, and we call our employees associates. Um, I'm just realizing now that Uh, I've been saying that. Um, So the associate had put that single item into a plastic bag and the customer said, oh, oh, it's okay. I don't need a bag. And so the item came out of the bag, handed it to the customer and then plastic bag crinkle up into trash. (laughs) And I'm, you know, we're working on this project and I'm, I'm over there gasping like, (gasps) No, no. Way. yeah, because <laughs> because the 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 idea of okay, everyone knows right. We have huge reach, four thousand stores. If you think four thousand stores, and if there's maybe five bags a store that that's happening to a day, 
you're talking 20,000 bags in a day. Right. That's a lot of uh, gallons of gas. A lot, (laughs) a lot of gas. Um, So the idea of these small moments, right, that that associate it to them, that's small. That's really small. Um, But it's those, how can we think about some of that differently? Um, my guess on your favorite is the it, it, it has a complex name, so I'll attempt to um, explain it in not the complex way, but it's like tea sack holder <laughs> fixture. Um, <laughs> it's basically the rack that the plastic bags hang on. If they get overfilled, um, as you are pulling a bag and you pull it off, the next one's supposed to kind of like open for you to to then pack. And when they get overfilled, they kind of come off in clumps. And then think about, like, the example I just gave where the associate threw it in the trash, right? Then, then you've got these loose bags. They don't fit. Like, and so they kind of end up getting potentially thrown away or crumpled up, right? And, but the idea is that it's just that it's getting overfilled. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the example or the nudge that we're talking about is, like, can we just put a line on the bottom of the fixture that says, like, don't, you know, don't fill past this. Just a fill line. Just yeah. a fill line, yeah, so that we don't overfill and you don't have that stringing. Because when we when we test it, it's like less than 1% of the time is an issue. Um, but that adds up. Like, we just talked about the single bag, right? So how are some of these really small things adding up and, and um, a potential problem we can solve really easily? Right. And that's where if it's, yeah, less than 1% of the time across 4,000 stores all day, every day. And in that case, you know, if you've got a stack of 10 or 20 or 50 bags because you overfilled it way too much and they get put in the garbage, that's a low hanging fruit opportunity that came up from having that good questioning experience, the right person that was able to say, you know, this is an issue that happens sometimes that your team wouldn't necessarily have known. uh, And some that you were able to have good conversation from being in the store, observing, seeing what was going on to help look for these nudgeable opportunities to try and reduce plastic. So let's talk about, you know, some other areas as you're looking into just some areas of the behavioral sciences that you're excited about, things that you want to be doing um, within your team at Walmart or just what you think would be cool and interesting, can be related to this project, can be anything else that you just think is of interest. Yeah, so I think part of working on this test that we've realized is that we're not necessarily set up for testing, in, especially in physical environment. So we do a lot of UX research of um, like the, the digital product. But when we think about physical, there's currently not really a way for us to measure bag usage in different parts of the store, right, to see are, are we using less. And so some of this project was an aha, too, of like, it's really hard to test and experiment in certain environments. Mm-hmm. Um, we also, you know, have have an opportunity of, like I mentioned earlier, we move really fast. So speed being very, very important, but the ability to make sure that we're measuring um, and replicating and making sure that we don't have like what you would call a false positive, right? Where we think that an intervention worked when it might have been the environment or the specific political party of that store, right, or, or whatever it may be. So really being thoughtful about that stuff. But what I'm, I'm super excited about is Walmart did just recently announce our first ever chief economist. Um, John List Yay. is going to, yeah, I know you've had him on the show. And um, he has a great book, um, The Scale, no, The Voltage, uh, the voltage Effect. effect yeah. was, yes, it's all about scalability, but it's The Voltage Effect. And he was a chief economist at Uber and Lyft. And so I'm really excited about this idea of organizations bringing um, capabilities in-house to make sure that we can experiment, we can experiment at scale. Mm-hmm. And um also still continuing to partner with the experts in the industry like yourself in the brainy business. So I think it's really important that realizing the opportunity and what the future of behavioral sciences is. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things I found in working with companies is that you, we want to do all the testing, right? And there is, I know that from when I've been internal at a company too, in a marketing department, 
we've all had that experience where you're working on a survey or a project or an experiment or get, setting up the focus group and you're in that last phase of getting the approvals or getting it set up and someone says, oh, you know, if we're already going to be sending that out, can we just add this and this and this and this and this and this? And no, <laughs> no, we can't add more things to it. So for everyone who has had that problem and kind of struggles with the response of like, how do I say no to it? There is an issue with cognitive overload, making sure we don't have too many things going on at one time. If you when you look at anything, and I talk with clients all the time about, you want to try to find the least amount of stuff. If you can only get one thing out of this project, out of this conversation, out of this piece we're sending out, out of this survey, this focus group, if only one thing comes out of it, what is the most important thing? What's the top result that we need? And then there can be some things that come in below that that are additional priorities, but they can't pull focus from that one thing. When you're trying to do too much, you end up doing too much and you don't get good results. And that is actually really freeing when it comes to experiments. And I think that was, uh, you know, in working with your team and, and any teams I've worked with on an academic side. So I teach um, applied behavioral economics through the Texas A&M University Human Behavior Lab. We have the largest, at least currently, academic human behavior lab in the world. Tons of great research stuff we're able to do there. And when you're on a academic side, you're looking for a teeny tiny thing that you can test. You test one thing very, very specifically and thoroughly. On a company side, you need a bunch of stuff. You need results and you need to be looking at them all like right now and trying to add in a bunch of stuff. The nice thing is it can be overwhelming to try to do that much stuff. And so it's a little bit freeing actually to look at doing small ongoing experiments instead of saying like, this is it. This is the one thing we're doing the one time. Whereas instead, and my, I have an entire episode about um, designing experiments and I talk about my, my three kind of basic rules being you want to be thoughtful about what you're doing, which is thinking about the problem like we were already talking about. Make sure you're working on the right things because you could test and analyze everything but that's a really bad use of resources. So you want to make sure you are thoughtful about what you're looking at. You're keeping it small. So you're testing one thing at a time and then you're able to test often. So in the case of the bags, and we're thinking about, you know, so if you were going to be running a test in a store, assuming as you overcome some of that testing issue and you're looking at an intervention like the fill line, it's not that you do the fill line and you put signage for the customers and you ask the associates to do this other thing and you send the email, right? But one store, one intervention, and then you see how it works. Yeah. I think sometimes we have the approach of everything. <laughs> all the things, all the time. Yes. <laughs> um, so it was also really good for us to think about that as far as how do we establish testing control? How do we create um, small you know, making sure that we weren't overlapping because it is, it's definitely something where they're like, well, if we're going to do this, then let's do this in that same group. And, and so it having to isolate that and explain and make it understood why I think it was really helpful too. Yeah. Having that thoughtfulness about the problem up front is also able to be shaped around knowing what you can test. So again, it's easy to get overwhelmed in this idea of all the things we could test to where you never end up getting started. You have that bike shedding problem of evaluating everything and coming up with a perfect plan to create the ultimate test. And so I think being freed from that to be able to say, if we were just going to try something, let's just do anything. But if you go in knowing what can you test for, what can you look at and have information about? And, you know, we had conversations about the bag testing and like, so are they delivered on pallets? Are they scanned somewhere? Is there, are they measured by weight? Is there, do we need someone to be watching the, the human chaperones, you know, that are looking to see who's using bags? What do we have at our disposal? And then we can shape the experiment to fit it, especially as we're just getting started. Yeah. And I think what was also really important for us was we, we, we differentiated between the nudge and the sludge mm -hmm. and said, we don't want to make this hard or painful. The, the, the point in the experience, the shopping experience is like 
I am trying to leave the store. I want to go home. I have cold groceries, right? So making that any more painful is would not be a good experience for for either associate or customer. Mm -hmm. And so it was important for us to kind of take all the sludge ideas and say, okay, those exist. And, and, you know, um, we'll, we'll set them over here on the side and that's not what this is focusing. So it kind of allowed us to narrow the focus and, and get down to, like you said, look, what if we just did two? What are, what are two, right? We don't have to have 30, but if we just, what, what are the ones that didn't make the experience Poor and that people were um, excited about and we felt like we could reasonably execute. Right. Yeah, it is an interesting problem in that the habit shift for any, everyone has tried to adjust a habit with the resolution or whatever, and you feel like you need this hard stop, right? And it needs to be this aggressive process to kind of painfully shift your behavior. And you can't do that <laughs> where yeah. customer experience matters. So how do you get them to have that moment of changing their behavior without having the shock and awe moment that's yeah. looking for. So the sludge being, so we talked about the nudge, right? And so a sludge being those elevator doors, making a little bit less convenient to do the thing is something that is considered sludge. Nudging would be if we look at, uh, so people are more likely to choose whatever's at the front of a, a line. You know, when you go into the cafeteria, we like to think, you know, if you set kids loose in a cafeteria with unlimited funds, their parents would never know what they got. We think it's just French fries and ice cream and candy and nothing else, right? But really, what you have at the front of the line is 25% more likely to be chosen. Those things at the back of the line or in a completely different line are 25% less likely uh, to be chosen. And whatever's at eye level, whether it's French fries or carrot sticks, you're more likely to choose. So choice is relative based on the context of the situation. People aren't taking in everything, but if we understand these rules, we know what they're going to be looking to be doing. We can have an idea of how we might add in some nudges to make it easier, you know, that aren't going to be destroying the experience and knowing both customer and associates. Complex for something as simple as use less plastic, right? <laughs> you get and start pulling at the sweater. This is my favorite part, right? Of finding, well, what, what else is there? What can we find? What do we want to uncover? It's a really uh, meaty project that I think is going to be ongoing with lots of insights for years to come. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so thank you again, Sarah. Any uh, last thoughts before we uh, close out our session? No, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here at IIEX and with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in today as we were talking about nudging for good at Walmart with the Brainy Business. So thank you again for joining us and enjoy the conference. Thank you again to Sarah Wilson for joining me on the live podcast stage at IIEX North America. And of course, to Green Book for inviting me to do two live shows there, as well as at the upcoming one in Amsterdam at IIEX Europe. So what got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? For me, I really love how this example really showcases what can happen when you work on the wrong question and how important framing is. Asking, how can we use less plastic? Got to a point of reducing plastic in the bags themselves, which ended up creating a new problem and an unintended increase in plastic usage. Of course, that's a temporary hiccup, and Walmart's dedication to sustainability means they continued to look for ways to improve and find new questions to ask. Finding new opportunities to incorporate behavioral science nudges into the habits of the associates and customers while maintaining great customer service in the process of reducing and sometimes eliminating plastic is a long-term endeavor and one I've been honored to be a small part of. I hope you have enjoyed learning about this project. And of course, if you have an idea for one of your own and are interested in working with me, I would be delighted to learn more and work with you. Please send an email to Melina at thebrainybusiness.com to start the conversation and see if we're a fit, whether it's got to do with sustainability or something else. I look forward to hearing from you. And as a reminder, before we close out the show, the notes for the episode with links to past episodes, 
related books like The Voltage Effect from John List, who, as Sarah said, is the newly announced chief economist at Walmart. So be prepared to hear about amazing things they're going to be doing in the coming months and years, to be sure, as well as other great links to contact information and about Green Book. All that is waiting for you within the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 206. And if you enjoy the experience I've provided here for you, will you share about it? That could mean leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen, sharing this episode or any other with a friend who you think would find value in the insights, or even hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate it and you. Thank you again to Walmart's Sarah Wilson for joining me on the show today and Green Book, of course, for having me out at IIEX North America. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Next week, join me for another live interview from that conference called Behavioral Bartending with Greta Harper of Maker's Mark. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain-friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.